Hello and welcome. We begin with the biggest headline across the world right now. U.S. President Joe Biden has decided to quit the 2024 presidential race. Biden's stunning move has upended the race to the White House. Now endorsements are pouring in swiftly for Kamala Harris. After Biden threw his support behind the current U.S. vice president, the Democrats are yet to put a blue tick to Biden's endorsement of Harris. If they do, the race could likely now be Harris versus Trump. What does this mean for the continent of Africa? How did Joe Biden navigate U.S.-Africa ties? And how could this change if Trump wins the election? Let's understand. America's engagement with Africa is not new. Since President Ronald Reagan, each president has had a signature policy initiative for Africa. But a serious and sustained engagement began under the Clinton administration. President George W. Bush also pushed U.S. development and security aid to Africa. It further deepened with significant bipartisan support under Barack Obama. Trump's election, however, signaled a radical break with this consensus. Then came Joe Biden. Biden said his administration was all in on Africa's future. He aimed at bolstering trade ties with African countries. In 2022, he hosted leaders from 49 African nations for a summit in Washington, D.C., and announced a $55 billion aid for new projects in the continent. But under Biden, America struggled to reassert itself in Africa as Chinese and Russian influence continued to surge. He has drawn attention for not visiting the African continent despite underscoring its importance on a global issues. He did, however, send his vice president and top diplomats on multiple visits aimed at a diplomatic upswing. But in the past few years, America's standing in Africa, especially the Sahel, has taken a hit. U.S. military presence and aid failed to stop the spread of coups across a belt, stretching from Guinea in the west to Sudan in the east, all ruled by military juntas now. U.S. efforts to nudge Sudan from military dictatorship to democracy ended in a bloody civil war which is still raging. In Niger, U.S. troops completed a withdrawal from their base in Niamey. The remaining troops will fully depart before a September 15th deadline set by the junta. These military bases provided intelligence in the war against Islamic State and al-Qaeda. Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger have now welcomed Russia as their ally of choice. In Somalia, U.S. troops are still supporting local forces fighting the al-Shabaab militants. Wars in Ukraine and Gaza have complicated ties between South Africa and America. The Biden administration dismissed South Africa's genocide case against U.S. ally Israel as meritless. Pretoria also refused to criticize Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. At times, African countries have been frustrated with the Biden administration, which they say has been distracted by crises in Afghanistan, Ukraine and the Middle East. By hosting the Kenyan President William Ruto for a state visit to Washington, President Joe Biden aimed at opening fresh doors of cooperation with Africa. But now Biden is out of the race and Ruto himself is fighting for his political survival back home. Now analysts say African leaders must brace themselves for Donald Trump again, who in his previous term had a purely transactional relationship with the continent. He too, like Biden, did not visit Africa during his tenure. Trump centered his Africa policy around countering China. His America First budget had put Africa last with major cuts to aid. In Africa, Trump's first term is also remembered for his outburst, where he used a verbal abusive slang for some African nations. His Muslim travel ban denied entry to nationals of a number of Muslim-majority countries, including several in Africa. So a return of Trump could mean a reduction in America's involvement in Africa and multilateral issues such as climate change and development aid. While some experts say his return may not be a pleasant news for Africa, 
others beg to differ. Now, Trump's transactional approach, mirroring that of China's in Africa, could prove comforting for some African leaders who are lectured on democratic backsliding and LGBT rights. Many of them are reluctant to have their governance come under constant scrutiny by the West. Trump, like China and Russia, does not necessarily attach principles of democracy to engagement. However, Trump's return could undermine anti-terror operations in the Horn of Africa. For now, America's political course remains highly uncertain. And how would it steer ties with the Africa also remains to be seen. Now, for more on this, we have with us Zemedene Negatu, a geopolitical commentator who is joining us live from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. What is your assessment of the relationship between the U.S. and Africa during Biden's tenure as president since 2020? Right. So, um, as you indicated in your intro, uh, there has been, I think, a dramatic shift, at least in tone, compared to the Trump administration. I mean, I'm talking about the Biden administration. Uh, yes, uh, not a whole lot, uh, as expected, was accomplished, but at least there was an effort by President Biden to re-engage with Africa in a meaningful way. I mean, you, you, your intro was very detailed. You've covered all the bases. For example, the U.S.-Africa summit uh, a little over a year ago. I mean, I was there. Uh, the, the atmosphere was very positive. Some meaningful, some some steps were taken. For example, you know, a lot of cabinet members, including Vice President Kamala Harris and others, came to the continent. The Federal Reserve, uh, the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen came. So a lot of high-profile people came. But to be very frank, <clears throat> in terms of substance. Uh, nothing hugely or transformational has happened in the last three and a half years. I think mm -hmm. President Biden was intending to come, but obviously because of other issues that you mentioned, he was not able. But at least the, the tone and the goodwill was there. And unfortunately, I think if, mm -hmm. if Biden and if Trump wins, I would see a reversal of even that positive momentum. So uh, a lot needs to be done. The 550 right. billion plus, or actually it was 70 billion that was committed during the U.S. Africa summit, I get to show a, a substance or meaningful way in Africa that needs to come start coming down. But I think part of the challenge for for the U.S. is it doesn't have the institutional structure to compete with the likes of China or even now in ascending India and others. Uh, the U.S. you know what it expects its private sector to come and invest. But U.S. private sector cannot compete with sovereign wealth that comes from China, for example. So I think there needs to be a complete rethinking. Uh, whoever comes in, I think hopefully it will be Kamala Harris. If it's the Democrats, I think the re-engagement will continue. But I'm afraid if it's President Trump, which is now an inward-looking isolationist policies, is documented in their policy even just last week yeah. at the Republican National Conven Con Convention, they've stated that. I think there will be a reversal or even downgrading of Africa's important right. in the White House and in Washington. Right. Yeah, on that, let's dig a little bit deeper. The U.S. has been in the past committed to partnering with Africa on various fronts, including economic development, trade, as well as peace, security, democracy, human rights and opportunities for the youth. If Trump wins another term as president, what impact do you think this will then have on U.S.-Africa ties? So, uh, listen, uh, the most important thing in Africa today is development, economic development. You cannot separate the other things you mentioned, democracy and other things, from economic development. So if the United States focuses almost exclusively, as it has been doing for a number of years, on these other things, to the exclusion of economic development, to the exclusion of ramping up Africa's youth to engage in jobs that are meaningful, then the other things, they will not resonate that well with Africans. So I think that the two needs to go together. As I said earlier, though, the U.S. is not in a position to provide billions of dollars that is needed for investments, not aid. Aid, yes, has a role, but the focus still continues to be in the United States, security, uh, aid, 
and that kind of stuff, as opposed to coming in with FDI, for example. There's relative, compared to the size of the United States economy, mm. American FDI in Africa is very small. So for Africans to be receptive mm. to what the U.S. Is, is trying to promote, the, the democracy, human rights, and other things, it also needs to see a meaningful engagement on the economy. Let me, let me give you a very good example. U.S.-Africa trade, uh, the last data I had, was, was it less than $70 billion. U.S.-China trade topped $200 billion. Mm. You, you see, so these are the kinds of disparities that the U.S. needs to fix if it wants to have a receptive audience. Even with, as I said, with the goodwill that the Biden administration has, they're all intentions. If it goes back to Trump, even that goodwill will be gone. And I don't think, I mean, he he's, was very clear in his first term. He didn't really want to engage with Africa, regardless, whatever it is, even the transactional description, I don't think is, is very accurate because if it, it was always Africa was an afterthought, okay? So I, my concern is even that little, you know, re-engagement that was started under the Biden administration probably will go by the wayside and on an occasional here and there kind of thing. But that is not going to do the U.S. Here's the problem the U.S. is facing. For example, today, uh, three African countries have joined the BRICS. South Africa, India, and Ethiopia. And more are going to be applying. The BRICS, if you if you look at the growth, where the growth of the global economy is going to be in the future, the BRICS is a good indicator where everybody wants to light it. The global south wants to be engaged via the BRICS. As you know, India and China and South Africa and Russia, these are the anchors who've now added a number of countries. Now it's 10. The rumors will be up to 20. But the U.S. has nothing to counter that. So, so I think this is where the challenge is for the United States. It's not just, you know, you can talk about human rights, you can talk about democracy. Uh, somebody once told me you can't need democracy. I completely agree. It needs to be comp uh, parallel to economic development, investment, and the U.S. can afford it. I mean, we saw that during the COVID crisis, they printed $6 trillion when it's needed. So it's not for lack of money. I think they just need to rejig the institutional infrastructure of the United States, the mindset. Let me give you a final thought. There's a forecast from Goldman Sachs, the big Wall Street investment bank, which says over the next 40 years or so, the 25 largest economies in the world. Of those 25, three are in Africa. Mm. Three, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Egypt. And there are many others just below that coming from Africa. So the U.S., as I said, has to understand the future is heading east. I always said there's a gradual shift of economic power from west to east. And I don't think a lot of people in Washington mm. either don't get it or they're not yet alarmed enough to be engaged with Africa, the youthful population of Africa, the right. growth, the, all the natural, the mineral resources right. today, our powers, our cell phones, our cars all come from Africa. So the U.S. doesn't seem to be in an alarm mode why it's been disengaging from Africa. Right. And just quickly, finally, considering Russian and Chinese interest in countries in Africa, how will the geopolitical situation be affected uh, depending on who is elected in November in the U.S.? Uh, well, listen, China is already heavily engaged in Africa. I think it will continue to do that. Russia in a slightly different mode. I mean, it has some a lot of economic engagement, but mostly in other areas. But it's again, it's a member of the BRICS, so I think it will continue to be actively engaged in, 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 in Africa. Geopolitics, huh? Good point. Let me give you an idea. If you look at just the Horn of Africa, Eastern Africa, 10% of yeah. global oil passes through that, that little narrow strait. 10%. And you know, at the moment, for example, with the Houthis and the, the the uncertainty in that part of the world, a lot of economic disruptions have happened, right? So geopolitics is very important. So the Chinese are engaged, the Russians are engaged, India is now heavily engaged or starting to engage, and the Brazilians as well. President Lula of Brazil was was in Ethiopia, spoke at the African Union, visited yeah. Ethiopia. So a lot of these either emerging countries or the ones that have already emerged, like China and India, have heavily engaged Africa. So geopolitics, yeah. and now, of course, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and in particular, the UAE also are, are playing a very significant role. So the U.S. seems to be ceding this very strategically important part of the world, maybe without thinking about it, because they're engaged, their their minds are in Ukraine, mm. the, in the Middle East, and other places, and Africa seems to be on the bottom of the shelf. Mm. That is not, I don't think that's yeah. a, a prudent way for the U.S. 
the world's largest economy, the world's probably only superpower to be disengaged from Africa. And I think so geopolitics will continue to play a role Absolutely. and it's better for the US to wake up quickly. Right. Thank you very much for being with us on First Post Africa and for your valued insights and analysis there. Thank you for having me. Across continents, one powerful news source. Bringing you diverse perspectives on the issues that matter. We go beyond the boundaries to give you that little extra about every sporting moment. So thank you for making First Post 5 million strong. We're counting on your support and you can trust us to bring you the news unfiltered and unvarnished. Climate change is on our doorstep. It's time for a revolution to take root. And it starts with 1.4 billion Indians. It starts with one tree. One tree for humanity. One tree for Mother Earth. One tree for our future. Project One Tree. A News 18 Network initiative.